Good afternoon. I'm now going to talk about an issue which is important to the government, both from an economic point of view, but also from an environmental point of view, and that's motoring taxes. I'm going to begin by talking about how well designed the current system of motoring taxes is, before going on to discuss some of the challenges that lay ahead for the government in this area, and how we can make motoring taxes ready for the future. So motoring taxes raise a lot of revenue for the government, and they're forecast to raise £40 billion pounds in 2019-20. That accounts for about 5% of total government revenue. A small amount of this comes from charges such as the congestion charge, with a slightly more sizable chunk coming from vehicle excise duty, but the vast majority comes from fuel duties, as well as VAT on these duties. Fuel taxes are important both from a revenue perspective, but what effect do they have in terms of household expenditure? The average household spends about just over 2.5% of their non-housing budget on fuel taxes. That's the expenditure on everything aside from housing. One concern that is often raised about fuel duties is that they hit the poor the hardest. In order to investigate this claim, we can look at expenditure on fuel taxes by income decile. What we see is that across the income distribution, households spend between 2 to 3% of their non-housing expenditure on fuel taxes. So it doesn't seem to be the case that the poor spend a larger portion of their expenditure on fuel taxes. What this graph doesn't show is variation in expenditure on fuel taxes within each of these income deciles. And what we see across the distribution is that about one in 20 households spend 10% or more of their expenditure that goes on non-housing on fuel taxes not on fuel, but just on fuel taxes. And insofar as these households might not have much choice over how much they drive or whether they drive, these taxes are likely to be particularly burdensome. Concerns about hard-pressed motorists is one factor often cited by the government in recent years for not having raised fuel duty rates. In fact, fuel duties have now been frozen in nominal terms for the last eight years. What this has meant is that as prices have risen, real, the real rate of fuel duty has fallen as shown by this dark green line. This is rather different from the picture, the plans laid out by the Labour government and then inherited by the coalition government as set out in their June 2010 budget, as shown by the light green line. Whilst we can debate about whether or not a reduction in the real rate of fuel duty was a good policy, what seems clear is that the way that the government has approached policy making in this area hasn't been effective. And that's because these, this freeze was never laid out in advance but rather successive governments have either delayed or cancelled plans increases in fuel duty rates, always maintaining that they will increase rates the next period, only to scrap those plans when the next period comes along, as shown by each of these grey lines which represent successive government plans. The failure of fuel duties to keep up with inflation has meant that the amount of revenue that the government now raises is about 5.5 billion less than it would be if rates had stayed at the same level as they were in 2010. And an additional just over 5.5 billion um, pounds lower than if ra rates had been increased in lines with the plans laid out by the Labour government. The freeze in fuel duties has been one factor which has led to a decline in the amount of revenue that the government gets from fuel duty as a share of national income, as shown by this line. The other factor which has driven this has been improvements in fuel efficiencies of cars. This means that a car needs less fuel to make the same journey. This decline in revenue from fuel duties is forecasted to continue, where the speed at which this takes place will depend on how quickly cars improve in their fuel efficiency, as indicated by these two scenarios, as well as the government's approach to fuel duty rates going forward. So these lines represent the scenario where fuel duty were to be uprated in line with RPI inflation, as is the government's stated policy. However, if it were the case that they were to continue keep fuel duty rates frozen, as they have for the last eight years, instead of finding fuel duty revenue somewhere in between these two lines in 2030, we'd find it somewhere in between these two crosses instead. Looking forward to the longer term, Fuel duty, rates, fuel duty revenue is expected to decline and completely disappear much faster than even this graph would suggest. And that's because the government has now committed to ending the sale of all new conventionally fueled cars 
by 2040, with a view to achieving its net zero emissions aim by 2050. What this means is that petrol and diesel cars will no longer be on the road, and therefore fuel duties will ultimately completely disappear in the next few decades. This is a fiscal challenge for the government, who must consider how they want to make up this shortfall. But it's more than this as well. It's also an economic and social challenge, and that's because there are good reasons to want to tax motoring more than other activities. And that's because motoring has wider costs to society, be that congestion or greenhouse gas emissions. We can try and put a value on these things, with the government estimating that each additional kilometre driven generates on average a cost of 17 pence, and that the vast majority of this comes from time lost in congestion, with other big costs consisting of accidents, greenhouse gas emissions, as well as local air pollution, noise, and damage to infrastructure. One of the key ideas behind taxing motoring more than other activity is that motoring taxes can incorporate these costs into the price paid by drivers, so that the prices they face reflect the true cost of their activities to society. In order to do this, in an ideal world, the tax on each kilometre would be set so it equals the social cost that that driving generates. In order to do this well, this would require taxes to vary as much as the social cost that driving generates, with some costs, particularly the larger costs of motoring, such as congestion, varying dramatically in ways that current taxes don't, particularly with when and where people drive. In order to give you an idea of just how much the social costs of motoring vary from a given kilometre, I can show you the distribution of the social costs of motoring. So what this graph shows is that many of the, many of the kilometres driven generate relatively small costs, whereas it's a small number which generate large costs. To put this into context, we can compare this with the average fuel duty paid per kilometre. What we see is that 50% of the kilometres driven generate costs which are less than half as large as the fuel duty paid on them. Insofar as fuel duties are meant to incorporate the costs to wider society generated by these kilometres, they're doing a poor job of doing this. They're much too high. What this graph doesn't show is the 10% of kilometres that generate the most social harm. That's because they don't fit on the current scale that I've put the graph up on. In order to show you those, I have to zoom out to a scale which is 10 times larger, to this scale. And these 10, the social harm generated by these 10% of kilometres is shown by the dotted line. Looking at this, it's probably unsurprising that 60% of all of the social costs generated by motoring is generated by just 10% of the journeys made, of the kilometers driven. These social costs are going to be very poorly, poorly targeted by fuel duties. That's because they're largely generated by congestion and people driving in very busy places at very busy times. Whereas fuel duties can't vary according to when and where you're driving. So how well do, is the current system of motoring taxes designed? As I've said, Fuel duties are poorly suited to targeting congestion and other more variable costs. But even if this is what they were trying to achieve, they're set too low. This is because the average total social cost of a kilometer driven is almost double the amount of fuel duty pay, paid for that to drive that kilometer. Fuel duties are, however, well suited to targeting the costs of emissions. That's because fuel consumption, as with fuel duties, both, are both proportional to emissions and therefore it can directly target these costs. However, if this is their aim, they're set too high. That's because the average fuel duty is almost six times higher than the social costs generated by both greenhouse gases and local air pollution combined. What about other taxes on metering? Well, two of the other taxes which are often talked about in the context of targeting the social costs of metering, particularly emissions, are vehicle excise duty and company car taxation. Vehicle excise duty consists of an annual tax levied on every vehicle registered for road use. The first year charge is linked to the car's CO2 emissions band, with more emitting cars paying higher fees. Subsequent year charges are flat rate, although alternatively fuel cars pay slightly less and electric cars are exempt. Company car taxation refers to taxes levied on the provision of company cars as part of an employee's remuneration package. These cars are subject to income tax and national insurance contributions, where again the rate depends on the CO2 emissions band that the car sits within.
Although both of these taxes are designed at trying to reduce total emissions that cars generate, they're not well targeted at discouraging emissions at the point of use. That's because the amount you have to pay in no way relates to how much you use your car and therefore doesn't relate to the social costs that your driving generates. If that's what we're trying to achieve, fuel duties are still the best targeted tool for that. That's because they provide the strongest incentives for those who drive a lot and also provide these ongoing incentives to drive less because they're not upfront charges. What both vehicle excise duty and company car taxation do achieve is they provide an incentive for people to buy cars which are lower emissions by making it cheaper. However, if this is what we want to achieve, this is even better targeted by a tax at the point of purchase, which would provide a better incentive to buy clean cars. This would be akin to the current first year charge of vehicle excise duty. So going forward, we've seen that none of the current motoring taxes do a great job at targeting the social costs of motoring. We've also seen that fuel duties will disappear in the next few decades if the government is to achieve its environmental commitments. Ultimately, the government could replace this revenue by taxing other activities. But we've seen that there are good reasons to want to tax motoring specifically. So one solution could be introducing a simple tax per kilometre driven. Like fuel duties, this would provide an incentive to drive less, but still poorly correct for the other costs that, motoring, that driving generates. A better approach would be to use this as a stepping stone to a more nuanced approach, with the ideal being a system of road pricing or congestion charging, where charges could vary both by time and location in order to properly capture the social costs generated by driving. We've already got a system of congestion charging in London, although this remains relatively blunt. You're currently charged a flat rate fee to enter into a particularly congested area at a particularly congested time. But once you're within the zone, there's no ongoing incentive to drive in less. So if you've driven here today, for example, you might as well drive around as much as you want. It's not going to affect how much you have to pay. The ideal system would be more comprehensive than this, with charges varying along all the dimension that the social costs that driving generates do too. And this isn't a pipe dream. Such systems have been put in place elsewhere, with Singapore having had a system for almost 20 years, which matches this description. So if we've got a vision for how we think motoring should be taxed going forward, the government should also think about how it would manage a transition to such a system. Politically, speed is of the essence. It will be easier to bring in new taxes while few duties can be reduced in return, whilst there's still something to give away. And before electric vehicles become widespread and the expectations of low taxes on motoring becomes ingrained. There's also a trade-off here. If in the long run we want to tax low emissions motoring, because ultimately all motoring will be low emissions, and we want to introduce these taxes sooner rather than later, this seems in tension with our short-run aim of encouraging the transition to low emissions motoring. One solution to this would be to bring in new taxes on motoring as soon as possible, whilst trying to encourage the take-up of cleaner cars in other ways, be that temporary subsidies for buying new, clean new cars or scrapping old ones or the provision of funding for infrastructure such as charging points. To summarise, the government must rethink how it taxes motoring. This is because revenue is disappearing and will continue to do so over the next few decades. And also the current system of motoring taxes poorly target the social costs that driving generates. We've laid out what the ideal system would be, and that would be a system of road pricing where charges vary by time and place. However, the government should think carefully about how it would manage the transition to such a system, with there being a benefit to starting as soon as possible and there being a need to use other tools to encourage the take-up of cleaner cars. The government might take a different view, but ultimately it needs a plan. It needs to lay out its vision for how it wants to tax motoring in the long run and how it wants to get there. Thanks. <laughs>